Good evening. Um, welcome to the ANPT's Vestibular SIG Facebook Live event, which today is not live. It's being recorded to post later. <laughs> um, my name is April Hodge, and um, I just want to let you know that we hold these Facebook Live events on the first Wednesday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And um, today's event, um, we're doing a more of a journal club format, and I have have with me um, uh, Deja, um, who is a new student volunteer who's going to be um, kind of helping uh, monitor things. And then I have um, Brian Lloyd, who is the author of um, the journal entitled Turning Towards Monitoring and Gaze Stability Exercises, the Utility of Wearable Sensors. This was published in JNPT in October of last year. Um, and uh, Brian, um, why don't you go ahead and just uh, start off by summarizing um, your article on research. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> for starters, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks for uh, those of you who took the time to read the article. Um, I'm happy to hear that it's getting a little bit of traction. Um, um, <clears throat> that's, uh, that paper specifically um, is uh, something that came out of an ongoing clinical trial um, that uh, I was working on during my postdoctoral um, fellowship at the University of Utah. Um, <clears throat> and in that, in that actual larger study, we were examining the use of, um, actually, we just recently finished are examining the use of vestibular-based uh, rehabilitation, um, a lot of VOR times one, times two exercises, postural control exercises uh, in people with multiple sclerosis. So you might've noticed in this article, um, it wasn't a uh, true kind of peripheral vestibular dysfunction group that we were examining, but uh, instead people with more centrally mediated vestibular dysfunction, specifically uh, multiple sclerosis. And <clears throat> the project really, uh, it kind of uh, materialized out of this idea that uh, we were using wearable sensors to kind of um, track the adherence to our exercise program for those people that were um, participating in the, in the protocol, the research protocol. And we thought, we started beginning to think, well, maybe we can actually use these sensors to kind of better um, understand how we're dosing uh, these gaze, gaze stabilization exercises, specifically, VOR uh, times one in the horizontal and VOR times one in, in the pitch, um, pitch in yaw planes. So <clears throat> really uh, it's a pretty straightforward idea. We used a um, inertial measurement unit or a, uh, which is a fancy word for an accelerometer or a gyroscope uh, mounted on the head. Um, and then we recorded people's movements of their head while they were performing those exercises. Um, and what really what we wanted to kind of capture is the frequency at which they were moving. Um, okay, so many of you, if you're doing this in practice, you might be using a metronome uh, to do that. Uh, we wanted to capture the velocity at which those angular velocity of those movements, and then also the amplitude. So that'd be the how far they were moving side to side. And we wanted to see if we could accurately kind of capture those. And first, we wanted to see if we could distinguish between a group actually just doing those exercises and a group not doing those exercises. <clears throat> so simply put, a group that's not doing vestibular retraining, do they look different than a group that's doing vestibular retraining? And the next thing we wanted to see is if we could use these sensors, <clears throat> or sensor, I should say, to see if we could uh, observe change uh, in these individuals over time. So they were participating in a six week intervention. And the whole idea, as you all know in PT, is we wanna be progressing people. So you should be training harder at week two than you are at week one, at week six, harder than you were at week three. We should be increasing the intensity. We need to be upping our dose to, in order to really drive change. And so <clears throat> we wanted to see if the sensor could detect this. And, and our three metrics, again, were the frequency at which they were moving, the velocity, and the amplitude. And um, as we kind of hoped, we were able to do both those things. So we saw between group differences in those things. And then we also saw that we, um, over time, I think this is the more interesting finding, is we detected increases in the frequency of movements. So if you're familiar with doing your VOR times one and you have your uh, metronome set at, at one hertz, uh, well, you wanna, be, you wanna be driving that 
up. If you just stay at the same frequency across the span, you're not going to be driving the air signal needed to increase the, the VOR. So, um, and what we found was that at the midway point, they had increased their frequency. And then again, at uh, six weeks, but at the cost of, um, which again is no surprise, a reduced amplitude and a slightly reduced velocity. And, and we could get into the details as to why that is, but um, the takeaway was that the sensor was, was kind of, and the, the long uh, summary there is that the sensor was kind of, uh, was able to do what we wanted it to do. Um, so you're talking about um, the, using a metronome. Did your um, subjects use a metronome in their home exercise program? And what exactly were they told to do in their home exercise program beyond just the, because I believe in the study, you saw them three times a week for six weeks. So a total mm -hmm. of 18 sessions that yep. were about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and so were they given like homework and were the, the homework from one group to the other different? Yeah, yeah, great question. So uh, yeah, three times a week in both groups, but then what they were doing during their in-clinic in visits were vastly different. Um, and what we were giving them at home. So the control group, if you will, in this, in this clinical trial was really told not to do anything at home. They, could, they were told to, uh, if anything, just do some walking, right? Because they're a control group. Um, Whereas the intervention group or the group receiving the vestibular-based rehab, um, they were actually given VOR times one exercises to do at home. Like you said, specifically, uh, we would help them download a metronome timer on their phone. Um, and there's tons of different apps out there that allow you to do so. And we would give them, uh, again, same similar to what we were doing in clinic, progressive. So maybe at week one, you're just uh, half hurt um, or we did some other things. We also did um, imaginary targets, depending on the severity of the person's presentation, and then progressing to VOR times two and VOR times one while walking, just depending on, it was a, it was a um, programmed kind of um, intervention, but people moved through it at different rates, right? So some of the people were much slower to progress, and so they didn't make it as far in the six weeks. But to your, to your, to your question, they had two totally different home exercise programs as well. And they were uh, asked to, they weren't all super compliant, but they were asked to do those uh, two days a week. So um, I'm guessing there wasn't necessarily like a sensor monitoring them at home or um, no. anything like that. That was just no, like kind of their word. Um, that's, the, that's the hope for the future, but um, it is not currently um, what we are doing. No, or we didn't do in this study, I should say. It was more just we gave them a piece of paper. Hey, do this exercise. Write down if you did it. And I believe you're talking about um, that you were making sure that your subjects didn't have any peripheral dysfunction through testing. Um, they were um, went through some screening. Um, and can you talk about you know what screening you did to kind of identify central versus peripheral impairment? Yeah, so that's a great question. And this was a, is a key part that we we had to be very um, strict about. So one, um, right off the top, they had to be um, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So they had to be neurolo uh, di diagnosed by a neurologist, either through MRI uh, or other means, and then referred from a neuro neurologist clinic. So right away, we knew we were getting people who had multiple sclerosis. But then on top of that, we needed to kind of rule out that they didn't also maybe have a peripheral hypofunction or a BPPV, um, something of that nature. So we did our full oculomotor examination, um, uh, observing for um, psychotic behavior, uh, smooth pursuit behavior, um, presentation of nystagmus, um, nystagmus in room light and with uh, visual fixation removed. Uh, we also did after, we observed for after head shake um, nystagmus and, um, and then with the tilt, downward tilt, for those of you familiar, to see if we would, um, again, looking for the presentation of a central dysfunction. Um, and I uh, can't remember everything I've already said. Um, and um, was also this all would, done with like VNG, so it could be like quantified? Yes, yes, great. We did this all with VNG. Again, the, the beauty of doing it in a research setting, um, all this was done in VNG. I, I know that that's not always possible for um, every clinic, but you know, um, 
not nothing you can't do or or generally do clinically. You just can't always quantify it. Yeah. And um, so I guess for our like watchers at home that you know maybe they don't have a VNG system. You um, what sort of findings specifically in the MS population with these dizziness symptoms? Um, what should they be looking for maybe in their bedside um, exam um, when they're doing like ocular motor? What did you find these patients presented with or reported that what might be helpful for them to like, okay, I need to go down this road? Sure. That's a great question and uh, a very, very muddy one. Um, I don't know uh, for those of you out there that are listening, if you've worked with people with MS a lot, um, widely varied presentation. So, um, of course, I, I wish I could say, yeah, we saw this, you know, very specific uh, oculomotor presentation. Uh, that's not the case. Um, oftentimes, we, uh, something we would see a lot is issues with like VOR cancellation, um, positive head impulse test. But again, that can go either direction, right? So we were also collecting video head impulse testing um, at baseline six weeks and at, at 10 weeks. And we saw um, pretty substantial uh, loss in, in vestibular ocular reflex gain in our sample. But again, even that was widely varied. We actually currently have a paper in review um, that's kind of just characterizing um, the presence of these deficits. And if that gets published, when that gets published, I think one of the key takeaways will be people with MS who report dizziness. So these are people that are scoring uh, on the DHI. They're reporting dizziness. They're reporting history of falls. They're reporting um, a sense of unsteadiness. So really people that are affected by their dizziness, um, but yet on their examination, on their presentation, um, widely varied. And so um, I think one thing we really took away from this is that um, there's definitely not um, one, one size fits all with uh, these people with MS. Um, I think it is worth doing your um, always doing your ocular motor examination if they're uh, complaining of dizziness um, and, and ruling out, um, well, not ruling out. If you know they have MS, you might just be confirming a little bit, um, maybe with where the lesion may be. Um, then again, um, I don't know if it's necessarily, we don't know at this time if it's gonna necessarily dictate directly how you're gonna approach um, your rehab. So um, we were using VOR, uh, Sibiocular reflex retraining exercises. Um, we don't know enough at this time to really suggest, um, you know, if maybe one, some of those people responded better to that than others. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot to that question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, it is complex, and these patients have a lots of varied presentation. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that you said that you did a V hit? Um, kind of at, um, you know, pro progressing and looking at that, did you find that that gain improved? It, I mean, obviously you, from your accelerometer da da data, that all improved and they were kind of mm -hmm. demonstrating progress mm -hmm. with their tolerance or ability to do that. But then did you also then see that kind of transpire as an improvement in their gain when you actually were doing like your head impulse testing? Yeah, so uh, you're you're you you're gonna I don't know um, you got to kind of wait on the edge of your seat. We haven't published our clinical trial results yet. Um, uh, we just finished that up. Um, we're writing those up now um, and hope to actually get those submitted um, soon. We would have got them. COVID COVID kind of got in the way and kicked this study down the road, uh, unfortunately, a little bit. Um, but um, hoping to get those out soon. Um, I guess the sneak peek I can say is that um, improvement in gain is complicated. <laughs> um, and so I, for those who are, are familiar with some of the literature, a lot of times we're seeing improvements in patient reports of dizziness and maybe even functional scores like um, DHI scores and um, maybe even D, um, DVA, maybe improvement in dynamic visual acuity that's not always reflected in an actual gain improvement. A lot of that can be driven by uh, better recruitment of saccades, better control of saccades, um, latency, a lot of things going into that. And so uh, without giving, talking too much about the results that we haven't published yet, um, it's, it, that, that improvement of gain is, is um, 
is kind of sneaky. So well, I'll be awaiting your next paper then. Okay. It sounds okay. like yeah, keep an eye out. Um, so based on I guess your research with um kind of progressing um patients with the accelerometer, mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that's appropriate in this population for goal writing or and patient education? Yeah, no, I think that's um I believe we're moving in that direction. And I think it's got a lot of um, utility moving forward. I, I think one thing we, I feel, and I, I think others feel too, is a lot of our dosing in vestibular rehab lacks some of this objective nature that we would like. Now, we have a lot of good testing for like the presence of impairment and maybe improvement, but on a day-to-day -day basis, when we're dosing exercise, a lot of times it feels like it's kind of it's very symptom driven and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but can we be more specific in how we're dosing our exercise? And so, you know, the, the analogy I always use is, you know, uh, we're, everything we do, everything we exercise in our daily life, we're very, very, we know tons about it. So if I'm going for a run, I know what my heart rate is. I know what my average mile pace is. I know what my splits are, you know, all these different metrics of that. I know what my cadence is and I can now begin to adjust elements of that to try to improve my function. Same thing if I'm lifting weights. I don't just lift non-marked weights that I have no idea how much they weigh and just lift them a few times. I know specifically I'm lifting this much. I did it this many times. And I need to do more than that. Well, with our vestibular ocular reflex retraining, we're doing that. And basically we're saying, hey, do this according to this metronome and try to not let me know if the if your object's getting blurry in your vision. We don't want to, you know, we're trying to strike this balance. I think there's a lot of value if we can better say, hey, your frequency is increasing, but maybe we need to drive up your velocity a little bit because we know our vestibular ocular reflex, if we're not moving at a high enough velocity, and we talked about this a little bit in the paper, you don't always drive the change you need in that system. So can we better monitor that People are actually reaching the velocities they need to be reaching. Amplitude is probably not as important, um, I don't think. But or velocity and frequency, I really think, um, are important metrics that we could use to start dosing. And um, I, I don't know if goal writing as much, uh, maybe necessarily. Um, but I, I know specifically when I'm dosing someone, hey, this is the dose I want you to be at today. I need you to be hitting... 120 degrees per second, and I need you to be doing it at 1.2 hertz. Okay, I'm going to put this sensor on, and then we can start thinking about things that give us real-time feedback, and that's where some of my work is moving it now is um, we're post-processing all of this in this previous study. I'm working on things that we can do now where you're doing these exercises, and I have software that's immediately giving you feedback about if you're reaching these goals. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I, another question about just um, the different groups. Um, so mm -hmm. your strengthening group or your control group, were they mostly doing machine strengthening? Were they doing, you know, something more dynamic where you would have some more head movement, like some lunging or some squats or something like that, just to kind of get a better idea of the differences between the two? Uh, yeah, so it was really, we tried to kind of reduce their head movements as much as we could. So they did um, new step, everybody's favorite uh, worst PT exercise. <laughs> and um, they did leg press and calf raises and uh, knee extensions, I believe. So it was, it was, it was really the goal was, hey, you're doing something. It was kind of like uh, um, the idea is that we could, uh, we wanted to, what we wanted to do was capture a kind of almost like um, clinical norm control, even though that's that's a really poor statement. But what is something that someone with multiple sclerosis might be expected to do? Well, they might just be expected to do general lower extremity strengthening and cardiovascular endurance. So <clears throat> it was not very dynamic and it was very, we tried to do avoid dynamic um, specifically to try to increase our um, group differences. Gotcha. Um, and then, um, I guess 
you did progress these um, patients. Um, was there any, or I guess were um, the individuals working with the patients instructed to progress them in any specific way? Um, just to kind of think about, you know, our listeners out there when they're working with a patient with MS and things to think about in terms of, did you try to push speed first? Um, did you try to put increase the postural demands, um, you, you know, um, a, a little bit about that exercise progression that you were um, leading them through. Yeah, sure. So um, one, I'll start by saying we published a protocol paper um, in 2019, I think, that pretty well outlines um, the protocol that we were using. I think, I can't remember exactly what journal it's in, but um, happy to share that or I, you should be able to find it. Um, uh, Lee was, uh, Dr. Dibble was the senior author. I was the first author. And it's just the proto, it's basically just summarizing what our study protocol was. So that would be a good reference for those interested. Um, but really, yeah, the whole idea was that um, we wanted to be progressing in something at every visit. It wasn't expected that you were going to progress every single element at every single visit, but we needed to be attempting to be imp improving whether it was, so we would start very low, right? So VOR times one horizontal, right? And um, some basic kind of static postural um, demands. But the idea was that over the course of each, each session, you were trying to, if possible, increase postural demands and increase gaze demands. Gaze and postural stability is what, kind of what we called it. And the hope was that we moved at every visit. Now, that was not always the case. I mean, especially with, again, with coming back to the complexity of MS, people just have really bad days, summer, and they're fatigued really bad with heat, and they come in, and you just know you're not progressing today, right? You're just wiped out. And so um, we had goals about what we wanted to achieve, and a lot of it was symptom-driven. So we would start every visit with a higher level of um, either gaze stability or postural stability exercise than the previous time. Depending on how that person res responded to that, we would kind of either move forward or we would kind of step back, depending on if they became overly dizzy, if they became nauseous, if they became uh, over overly fatigued. Um, it definitely wasn't, a, this is the, the total issue with um, physical therapy clinical trials. It's hard to control for all of these things. Um, and so while we had goals for these constant progressions, there were definite um, issues with that. And I guess just for other people who might be new to working with this population, I know mm -hmm. sometimes when I've initiated VOR exercises, I've even started people on sitting um, yeah. especially mm -hmm. if they're doing that at um, doing it at home from a safety perspective. So yep. is that something you would also kind of recommend depending on their abilities? That's great. Yes, 100%. I think it's it's important you hit on that. Um, we had several people that started in sitting um, uh, that were just, you know, you start doing VOR and they're like, they're super high risk for falling over. So we would begin in sitting, then we might progress to trying to stand with maybe even like a slight bit of hand touch, uh, holding on to something or a wide base of support. And, and so again, that bottom line varied. We also had people who were you know, had reports of dizziness, but they also were trail runners and, you know, mountain bikers and they were young and they were super high functioning. And so where they started was a, a to totally, um, totally different uh, level. MS is, is just uh, so complex. Um, I, my next question would be, did you see um, similar changes in both um, the vertical and horizontal planes um, with in, within your group. Yes, yes. Uh, as far as like in, you mean with the um, sensor and like the progression? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think I, I don't know. I have to look back at the paper to know exactly what we found, but um, I'm pretty sure what we observed was increases in frequency, which was good. Um, and we didn't find actual time effects or changes over time in the velocity and the amplitude. Amplitude shows a trend towards reducing, which if you think about it, makes a really pretty good sense. Because if I try to really drive up my frequency, I can't do that 
with a really large amplitude head movement. It's hard to, without hitting a super out, outrageous velocity. Um, so we kind of expected amplitude to decline while in, in, as kind of the inverse to that improvement in frequency. Um, and velocity kind of honestly held steady. Um, when we looked at the data specifically, and again, if you look in there, there's some pretty big error bars. Um, some of the people, you know, just weren't able to tolerate. I think there's a lot of things going into that. Um, one, the dizziness coming on with these higher velocities. Also, um, just kind of the strength and coordination and maybe if they had a little bit of um, tone and or some kind of spasticity in their trunk, in their neck, this kind of faster movements just became more and more challenging um, for them to really coordinate. And I think I remember, and I wrote him a note to myself, um, that you, with your gaze stability group, you didn't necessarily see a huge change in the velocity, like you were saying, no. but they were still reaching velocities that were helping to drive um, physiologic change. Yeah, as a, as a mean, our means were at levels that were high enough. Um, some people didn't, unfortunately, but you know, you want to be if you, if you want to think about why we're trying to do that. So when we switch from, we can use smooth pursuit mechanisms, right? To maintain visual fixation, but at a certain velocity of movement of my head, I can no longer rely on that. Um, that's that kind of cortical driven, smooth pursuit, cerebellar driven, smooth pursuit method. I have to switch to a reflexive VOR. And that's somewhere around hundred to 120 degrees per second, somewhere. Uh, I don't, I don't know if it's 100% known exactly where it shifts, but you got to be hitting pretty high, um, some certain level of velocity to make sure you're driving the VOR. And and our on average, our people were were hitting that level, which was 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 a positive takeaway. I think that. Oh, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I just think that again comes back to the utility of these um, that you don't get from just. Uh, um, doing it in clinic with a metronome. Yes, you're able to try to hit these targets. But you're not getting any feedback about the velocity someone is actually achieving. And if we can get them, you know, there's, you can get a pretty high frequency, but if I reduce my head motion, motion enough, I don't have really high velocities. So um, if we are able to use the sensor, I think we can get more um, usable feedback to really kind of hone in on that that special ingredient that we think can drive that change. And um, I think my last question would be, you know, you showed these gains from a, you know, sensor standpoint, when you look at the data, mm -hmm. but how, did the patients feel like they got better? I mean, cause that's the end result, right? We want yeah. our patients to feel better and not only feel better, but maybe even like reduce their fall risk. So did you yeah. notice that? Certainly. So our DHI score is improving. Um, people are reporting significant improvements in the way they feel as far as their um, uh, sensations of dizziness. Now that wasn't always true from day to day. So um what we would see sometimes, and this should come in no surprise to anyone who's practicing, is you take one step forward and then maybe you might overdo it a little bit and you take a step backwards and someone actually feels really dizzy um, after having done a bunch of this training and they kind of feel wiped out. We saw this, I think in MS specifically, you can see this. Um, it's, it's, you can definitely got to strike a balance with people training really hard because they, they, they like how they're feeling. They feel like they're reducing their dizziness and they come in and they're trying to hit higher velocities and higher frequencies. And then they just like kind of go off the, go over the edge of the cliff and they kind of tank and they get really get busy and they kind of take a step back. So from day to day, we didn't always see improvements, but as a whole, people were feeling like their symptoms of dizziness were, were reducing, which yeah, is great. Individuals with these like central pathologies, I think in general are just more sensitive. So you've got to be careful. Yes, I think that's a great point. And I think um, it became very, very evident um, with, with working with this group. Again, some people, you could push them all day and they would just respond. And then others, um, you know, it, they'd be going cruising right along and then uh, step in the wrong direction. So uh, I, I, again, though, I, to, to, you know, keep selling the idea, 
this could help us maybe better hone in on that because you can begin to objectively quantify the movements that someone's doing. And so maybe you can avoid that cliff a little bit better. Like, hey, you responded really well at 100, 100 degrees per second and um, 1.5 hertz. That was great. That I, and then you come in the next day and I'm observing that all of a sudden you're trying to hit 130 degrees. I might say, hey, Miss Smith, let's, let's actually take it down just a little bit because you really jumped up, which is great. I know you're trying to get better and you're, you're trying to move faster and et cetera but maybe you're overdoing it. I don't know. I, I can imagine a thousand ways in which this, um, this could be, it, I feel like the more we know, <laughs> uh, the better we're positioned to, to improve our care. Well, I think unless you have any last points or um, pearls of wisdom you'd like to share, I think <laughs> maybe we could um, wrap up with that one. Sure. Um, no, I just, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I, I, like I said, I think the future work, some of the stuff I'm doing now at the University of Montana, um, as I've moved on, is, is trying to move some of this stuff into more, um, I, I will say, what we did in this study was very kind of research-based. Unfortunately, we're using expensive sensors. They're not readily available for clinical. I mean, you can buy them, but most clinics aren't going to. And then we were post-processing. But the step in the right direction, I think, is, is working towards getting this kind of stuff um, available for more day-to-day -day clinical use. So um, keep, keep your eyes open there. And we're hoping to get some stuff out there soon. Well, we'll um, be looking forward to your future studies coming out Great. and especially this one pending so I can figure out whether the game gets better or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, hopefully soon. Um, be on the lookout for the characterization of just what these people look like, what their gains look like and things of that nature. And then subsequently our, our, uh, our clinical trial results, hopefully in the next, uh, the next few months. So. Well, fingers crossed for you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Brian. Thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you. Um, feel free to sign off. And um, this is a pseudo live event. Yes. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate your time.